Yeah, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Okay. My name is uh, John Brown. I was a Foreign Service Officer for over 20 years, and um, I uh, resigned from the Foreign Service uh, over the war in Iraq. And uh, tell, talk about when... Mm -hmm. is it? Oh, are you getting it? The central air? Is that what it is? I guess it's fine. I think it's probably fine. Oh, can you just do a testing one, two, three? Testing one, two, three? Yeah, it's just uh, ambient. Okay, sorry. Okay. Um, okay, so why don't you uh, talk about the specifics of, uh, from your perception of where you are at and what you were seeing. Today? No, uh, I'm sorry. Um, you, you resigned on, <clears throat> was it March 10th? Yes. And so talk about leading up to that point and what you were seeing and what drove you to. Okay. Bef um, <clears throat> I was teaching a course at Georgetown University on public diplomacy. And for that course, I examined very closely the uh, statements of the administration to justify the war. And I simply was not convinced by the case that was made. Um, and the statement that struck me the most was one that was made uh, in September of 2001 by Andrew Card, who was the chief of staff, who is the chief of staff of the Bush White House, saying uh, um, that uh, a, a, uh, you don't introduce a new product in the summer, and he was referring to the war, and that's why they started the, uh, if you will, the campaign to sell the war to the American public in the fall of 2001. And I'm sorry, I'm just, is it, a, I think it was 2002. Oh, two, I'm sorry. Oh, so, sorry. Yeah, yeah, I, just, yeah. I just want to get yeah. that yeah. right. Thank you, so thank you. Yeah, sorry. Uh, sorry, is that all right? Yeah, yeah, yeah just, uh, start, and, uh, just start from the top. Okay, uh, to introduce the campaign in the fall of, of 2002. And for me, um, reducing or uh, a war to a product or saying they're essentially equivalent, to me that was simply appalling. And uh, that's when I became really very critical of the administration. I, and I looked at the statements even more critically. And I became uh, increasingly convinced that they were uh, base uh, propaganda um, and showed all the, uh, fin all the uh, uh, tricks, if you will, of base propaganda, everything from constant repetition of, of certain phrases uh, to demonization of the opponent uh, and, of course, simplification of the argument. And uh, so I was, uh, by the beginning of the new year, I was very, very, very critical, very skeptical about why we were doing this. Also, you know, the American media uh, did not really cover, I thought, what the outside world was saying about all this. And uh, there was enormous criticism outside of what, what the United States was, was planning to do. And of course, we can't act without, our country can't act without taking into consideration uh, world public opinion. So, and so finally, uh, you know, the, the straw that broke a camel's back was, was the president's press conference uh, just prior to, to the war, where uh, in this imperial White House setting, he, he announced before uh, timid uh, media representatives that uh, the war was just about to, to take place. And there was no questioning of this. It was kind of an acceptance on the part of, of the American media, no critical questions. Um, and so after that press conference, I simply said, I, I simply cannot um, uh, be part of this. I am, after all, uh, in the Foreign Service. And uh, as a Foreign Service officer, part of my job is to support and justify American foreign policy. And there's a point where, this point, where I simply couldn't do it with, with whatever conscience I have. <laughs> And um, when you, to some extent, it seems like the uh, blame can be laid on the, uh, the executive branch, the uh, judicial, or the uh, you know, congressional branch of uh, giving the authorization, but also the media and the the public. Can you, from your sense, yeah. can you kind of talk about how you see that? Well, I think the, and you know, this is not a, an original idea. I think the shock of 9/11 was such in the United States that people, the public, ordinary Americans, well, if we can talk about ordinary Americans, were, were looking for an explanation uh, for this and frankly looking for who was guilty and who should be punished. And um, so, you know, that provided, if you will, the context that made it uh, 
so easy for the administration to, to sell this war, which, as has become increasingly clear, had little, if anything, to do with 9-11. Uh, I mean, the, the people against whom the war was fought, namely Saddam Hussein. So um, I, I think that because of the tragedy of 9-11, um, people uh, forgot to put on their critical, um, uh, well, they forgot about their critical thinking, that you have to look at things critically. And, and they were too uh, eager, too ready to accept the administration's very simplistic uh, case for war. And that includes the Congress. And they really, people should have asked questions right away, and they didn't. And I think that within the State Department, uh, I don't think uh, critical questions were raised uh, early on. I, I think there was always skepticism among my colleagues at the State Department, but I think the higher ranking people at the State Department really could, could have asked earlier, why are we doing this? What's the purpose of it? Um, and I don't know if that question was asked, really. It was more, well, we're going to do it. Now, how are we going to sell it to the American public? And the State Department would add, how about world public opinion, Mr. President? But my reading of this is that it was essentially an afterthought, that the decision was made to evade Iraq. Why, it's still not clear to me. I mean, there are all kinds of speculation. My initial reading of the situation um, was that it was uh, uh, political, uh, domestic, uh, as a way to make um, the president uh, look good for the November uh, 2002 elections as a commander in chief, decisive, ready to take on the enemy. But the more we get into this, um, this tragedy of, of, of the Smith's adventure in Iraq, the clearer it becomes that there were more elements involved in that, uh, both from uh, the neocons, if you will, but the story still has to be told exactly why we did this. And uh, from your sense, uh, do you, you know, attribute um, controlling access to, to other people who don't get access to the oil or Israel? Or, you know, have you looked at the thinking of the neoconservatives who were you know. kind of the ideological drive towards this war? Well, you know, again, it's very hard to tell. I mean, I think it's going to be a task for historians, and an enormous research will have to be done to understand exactly why we got into this war. You know, my point in resigning was that, to me, it wasn't justified properly, <laughs> to, you know, to us Amer Americans and to the outside world. Um, I think, you know, one must never forget confusion. I mean, I was in government for over 20 years, and the amount of confusion, uh, lack of coordination, is unbelievable. And, you know, I wouldn't uh, cancel that element as part of the equation of why we got into this war. Uh, Maybe it's conceivable that people in the, in the administration weren't quite sure, or there was a lack of coordination between the State Department, Department of Defense, and the, the ball got started, and here we were into war. I mean, I don't, I don't uh, you know, uh, think that should be taken completely out of consideration. I, the problem that's happened, I think, is that because the war was so poorly justified, it has led, especially in the outside world, to conspiracy theories about what was the United States, what is the United States up to, this lack of clarity on the part of the administration in justifying what we are doing leads to these wild speculations about the United States, which don't help us, especially in, in the Muslim world, you know, then, you know, it's because they're after the oil. It's because of, you know, these grand theories about um, what we're doing, which often lead to uh, a simplification of the United States itself, you know, and, and we're, we're not, we're a complex country with, uh, um, so, you know, that's the lack of clarity has led to conspiracy theories. And again, my question is, I wonder if the administration itself was really sure why it got into this war. And uh, when you talk about the, the foreign press, from your sense, what kind of information were you gathering? What kind of sources were you looking at? And what kind of stuff that did you see wasn't being really incorporated into the debate? Well, I think the thing that was not incorporated into the debate were, was the immense criticism outside of the United States regarding this war. Um, and the dismissal on the part of the administration of, of critical uh, opinion abroad about what we were doing. 
um, you know, um, part of this uh, you are with us or against us mentality that very reasonable voices abroad, in many cases pro-American, saying, you know, what are you getting yourselves into? Why are you doing this? And a complete dismissal of that. Um, and, you know, that, of course, led to the view that we were uh, not paying attention to what other people were saying, that we are hegemonic, that we make up our minds first and don't, you know, ask questions later. And I think it's hurt the United States terribly, our image about how we're seen abroad. Uh, because, you know, in the past century, uh, the United States, for all its faults, as seen by foreigners, I mean, everything from we don't know how to use knives and forks properly to we have bad manners to <laughs> we're too loud, you know, we drive too many cars. But I, I think essentially there was a belief abroad, even in, well, even communist countries where I served most of my career, or socialist countries, that, you know, when the chips are down, uh, the Americans are, are on the good side. I mean, that, you know, uh, and this, this was the experience of the 20th century, World War I, World War II, where, you know, we came in and, if you will, fought the, the enemy. And in this century, with what we did in Iraq, and which we did so unilaterally without taking into consideration the views of other countries, we're seen as the sheriff who shoots first, and uh, uh, it's, it's, a very, it's going to be, take a long time to get over that. I mean, not to speak of these dreadful images of, of the prison in Baghdad that have replaced the Statue of Liberty as, as, if you will, the American icon. And, of course, images change, but um, I think it's, we're going to have a terrible, terribly difficult time to, I don't want to say remake our image, but to change the perception of the United States. And I, uh, you know, what I mentioned in my letter of resignation is that the policies of the Bush administration have given rise to an anti-American century, whereas the past century was really the American century, if you will. You know, we enter the world stage after World War I. In World War II, we helped defeat Nazism. We, you know, democracy, uh, 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 confronted totalitarian countries and came out, I won't say victorious, but the world was made a safer, more democratic place, you could argue, um, despite all our mistakes. But then comes the 21st century and then this misadventure in Iraq, poorly thought out, poorly justified, poorly planned. Even today we're seeing the, the results of just, you know, awful planning about, you know, we get there, then what are we going to do? I mean, <laughs> they didn't think about that. I mean. And this an incredible arrogance on the part of the White House, um, uh, the arrogance of the provincial, because, you know, it was the assumption that we'd move in there, they'd treat us as liberators, and that's it. But, I mean, it's a complicated country, terribly complicated country. And, and you know, they, we were like innocents, or innocents, I mean, I mean, it's, uh, that's, I mean, here we there, you know, with our armies, our soldiers moving into a place we practically knew nothing about, and now we're seeing the consequences. Uh, I mean, it, um, and not to speak of the cost of this thing, I mean, it's costing money. Um, and, and the tragic deaths of civilians, uh, which, by the way, the American media did not cover, hardly covered, the, you know, the terrible side of this war. I mean, I, I never forget when I saw that shock and awe the first time. I was just absolutely appalled. Uh, and I, you know, my one satisfaction, I, sadly enough, kind of satisfaction in quotation marks was that I had left the Foreign Service and that, I, you know, that shock and awe I was not part of. I, I didn't take part in its production. I mean, just awful. Um, I mean, is this the way you bring democracy to the Middle East by shock and awe? I mean, no. I mean, if that's the justification for what we did, which evidently is an afterthought with this administration. I mean, you know, we, we all know the story now. First, it's regime change. I mean, weapons of mass destruction, regime change. And it was the final thing, you know, it's going, to be, it's going to take a generational commitment to bring democracy to the Middle East. I mean, just afterthoughts at most. And, uh, and from a viewpoint of public diplomacy, it seems that uh, the United States have a, has a different view towards the United Nations and international law with the other nations. Can you speak to how we see uh, international law, how other countries see international law, and how it protects us versus how it protects them? 
Well, I think this administration has certainly not taken international law seriously at all. I mean, it's, it's made it very clear through its messages, and especially through its actions, that, you know, we're the most powerful, M might is right. But, you know, that may bring short-term ad advantages, but long-term, it's, it's disastrous. Um, because what we mustn't forget, and it's so easy to forget that in the United States, which is, which is such a prosperous country, is that we're a minority on this planet, you know. And um, we will have to face the, f the demographic facts that, you know, we're a small part of the world's population. And right now we're enjoying incredible wealth, incredible prosperity, but, you know, you can't separate yourself from the rest of the world. I mean, and uh, I think this is what, ironically, this is what this administration has done ironically through this foreign misadventure. It's created a kind of fortress America that doesn't pay attention to uh, really mankind, the rest of mankind. But whenever it feels threatened, it's going to you know throw, send in the the rockets and the planes and, and and blow people up. But I mean that's not long term uh, in our national interests. And you know the, contrast this with you know the vision after the Second World War of. of America the generous, I mean, you know, defeated Germany, defeated Japan, how generously we, we reacted. And, you know, to make comparisons today between, you know, the, well, we in World War II and we in, in this Iraqi misadventure is simply disingenuous. I mean, it, it just, you know, it just doesn't work. I mean, what, what this administration has shown is a singular lack of generosity, and, and which is the best part of the American character, you know, that, that, we, we, we're willing to help, we're willing to share, we're willing to, um, uh, and this has not been at all the mentality. It's been, you know, we're the toughest, we're the strongest, you do what we do, what we want. If you don't do what we want, we beat you up. And long term, that doesn't work very well. I mean, it, it provides, you know, short term satisfaction, kind of, you know, Rambo stuff. But. Can you speak to um, the efforts of like Charlotte Beers and Margaret Tutwiler yeah. in the Middle East and the, the approach to public diplomacy? It seems to be, you know, uh, transmit stuck on transmit and there's no receiving and listening. Well, well precisely. I, I think you're making a very good point. I mean, you know, public diplomacy at its best um, establishes a dialogue between Americans and the rest of the world. Um, in as we take part in this dialogue, of course, we present our point of view, you know, our America, you know, the American point of view, or the point of view of the American government. But we listen and we take into consideration the views of other, of others. Uh, but you know, this administration has not taken diplomacy seriously, and th this will lead, explain why it doesn't take public diplomacy seriously. You see, diplomacy is is, is in essence negotiations between two parties. But this administration does not, has not essentially believed in negotiations, has believed in force, has in, believed in the imposition of the American will upon the rest of the world and not really uh, talking, negotiating with the rest of the world. I mean, there are exceptions, of course, there are, you know, but I'm making, I think, a justifiable general statement, certainly as indicated by the whole Iraqi misadventure. Now, if this administration doesn't believe really in diplomacy, it really doesn't believe in public diplomacy either, because uh, public diplomacy is meant to complement diplomacy. It's meant to support it. It's meant to, if you will, uh, assist it. Um, and so instead of public diplomacy, what we have is propaganda. And propaganda is a, a weapon of force, you see. Propaganda is a unilateral um, message that you impose upon an, an audience, a target audience, and, and the way you make it work is by the, you know, these, these tricks and tools of repetition, demonization, appeal to atavistic feelings of fear of the other. And this has been what really this administration has used. And ironically enough, this base propaganda approach didn't work abroad because most foreigners just didn't buy it. You know, they, they saw it for what it was. Whereas here in the United States, we bought it. Uh, you know, American public opinion bought this really base propaganda, which, which the rest of the world said, you know, what is this? I mean, this doesn't make any sense. So, uh, 
you know, because the administration believes more in base propaganda than in the subtleties of public diplomacy, which like, which, you know, include give and take and exchange, they have essentially dismissed it. And the people who were in charge of public diplomacy, this Miss Beers, I mean, is, is, is a person, she's a, uh, she sells shampoo. Uh, I mean, she's clever at selling shampoo, but, you know, America's not a product, America's an idea. America's a, a com very complex idea. And, and you don't sell an idea the way you sell, you know, a product to get rid of, of dandruff. And, and this was the approach. Um, and it didn't work, again, because, you know, the, uh, the world is becoming increasingly sophisticated. I mean, people are not stupid. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, the assumption of propaganda, and, and read Nazi propaganda, the assumption is that people are stupid and primitive, you know. Uh, but in fact, I would say they're not. And uh, because of education is becoming, you know, worldwide and people, more, you know, through mass communications, they're very sophisticated. So if you want to reach them now, you have to, to, to be subtle. And, you know, doing stupid little videos about Muslim life in the United States is not going to do the trick. Um, also, you know, one of the best parts of public diplomacy are, of course, educational uh, exchanges, long-term commitment to exchange of students and teachers and professors. This administration has shown very little interest in that. I mean, the programs, thank God, uh, some of them continue, you know, uh, but there's been no initiative to, to really have uh, major educational programs uh, installed, in, especially with the Muslim world, which is critical at this point. I mean, even the Washington Times had a recent article saying that we really need our educational programs with the younger generation in Muslim countries today. Instead, uh, the administration has used what I would call a, essentially a propaganda approach, which is, you know, t television to sell uh, kind of to uh, the target audience, the American policy. But, and you know, I, I won't question the motivations of the people taking part in these programs, creating them, Al Hura, for example. I mean, I, I think they're doing their best, but the approach is flawed because, um, you know, from what I read, um, you know, audiences in the Middle East consider Al Hura propaganda. Uh, they um, they're not convinced by 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 it. They're not uh, moved by its messages. Um, and you know, there are all kinds of technical problems too when the U.S. government gets into television. I mean, it's you know, even from the point of view of just quotes good TV, the U.S. government's not good at that. It's all it's always it's too slow, it's too, uh, you know, it's too canned. They, they, they have programs that sometimes have, you know, they just have to fill the time and they use silly programs. Worse, they can't keep up to the minute with the news because, you know, that takes an enormous amount of resources. And, and the U.S. government really, even though it's put a lot of money into Al Hura, you need more if you really want to have, you know, an up-to-the-minute news service. Um, I did read one very interesting article recently that may be a way to, quote, maybe, they don't, that's not the word of the article, but maybe to save Al Hura would be to turn it into a kind of C SPAN where, you know, uh, Muslim, uh, well, Arab Muslim audiences would get undiluted footage from uh, American democracy at work. You know, sessions of Congress, just the way C SPAN does it, with no commentary. Maybe, well, maybe, uh, maybe you need, of course, some, you know, uh, translations, but just undiluted. And that, I think, would not be considered propaganda. I, you know, it, it would be, quotes, boring at, at times. But imagine for uh, an Arab audience to look at the hearings with uh, Secretary of Defense uh, Rumsfeld, you know, about the, the prisons. I mean, this would show, I think, that America is willing to show the world, you know, its deliberations on this. So th that would be my way of, quote, saving Al Hura. And in fact, it pro would probably be cheaper than trying to, you know, have talking heads, programs that, that are not appealing to, to, to audiences there. You know, I mean, they, they, there are many, many television stations there. You know, this is not like the Cold War. You know, there's a, and we just can't you know, send bad television that's considered uh, propaganda. We have to, to find a new approach. And I would suggest a C-SPAN one for, for that particular 
I got a uh, with the uh, issue of, of government secrecy. It seems to be um, the secret. You know, the government will make uh, secret certain aspects of reform policy that may be embarrassing, and, and as opposed to uh, protecting our actual national security. Can you speak to you know your experience of that and what you've seen, and, and how we even treat uh, disseminating information to our own uh, yeah. public? Well, you know, I, I was in public diplomacy. My job was to open doors, not close them. Um, you know, there's obviously a need to keep certain uh, documents uh, within the government. However, my experience has been that many, that too many documents are overclassified. And, um, you know, one of the things about classifying a document is that it prevents its stupidity from being exposed to the public. Um, so I, I'm very skeptical about classified documents, while at the same time uh, recognizing the importance of not making at all times everything public. Um, but you know, as a principle, I think the more public, the better. Uh, you know, what do we have to hide in many cases? Um, so. Um, and you know when you say sure look at it again the, this conspiracy these conspiracy theories don't, don't um, uh, so I think there's too much classification of documents um, and I, I hope that the government can open up uh, but you know one of the things that's really happened with our government I can you know base this on my experience is it's become so big so complicated so confused I mean it's just amazing even within an embassy. A, you know, a large embassy, how much the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. I mean, it's, it's, it's really unbelievable. Now, you know, people will say you need weights and balances, and, you know, maybe that's all right, but um, the confusion at times, and one of the things that classification of documents does is hide <laughs> this, this immense confusion that exists within the government bureaucracy. Um, I just published a little piece uh, in the Post about the new embassy in Baghdad, uh, where I raise questions about, you know, why does it have to be so big? I mean, it can be, you know, 1,600 people in there, 1,000 Americans. And my point is that, um, you know, if we want to send the signal that Iraqis should run the country themselves, what are we doing setting up this mega embassy, which will be, uh, you know, restricted in many ways to this so-called Emerald City, you know, the green zone, where the Americans won't have, will have hardly any contacts with the world around them. And, you know, will be Americans uh, talking to Americans about Americans, you know, and, and that's not diplomacy. Um, <laughs> and I think it would be a wonderful signal to say, well, we're setting up a small embassy here. Uh, and frankly, it would probably be more efficient because Huge embassies sometimes are not very efficient, and, and they become a world of their own. It's, um, it's, it's, and that's not good. And I'm not sure if you've been following like techniques of public relations. You know, it seems to be the goal of public relations is to have one-sided debate and not uh, seriously consider the other point of view. And uh, what is the solution to this? Uh, you know, uh, both sides having these public relations techniques where they're talking at each other, even within our own yeah. government, and then you have the news media in some ways not even aware of what's going on, and they're just saying things at face value. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, well, I think it's a very interesting point. I think that and it's a paradox, because even though the mass, of, mass communications have increased enormously, become much more sophisticated, uh, as you say, people are really talking less to one another. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's a bit like people sharing offices, but they don't talk while they're sending to each, say, two people are sharing offices. They don't talk to each other, but they're sending millions of emails a day. <laughs> so it's, it's a bit that situation. That, um, our technological society has created a situation where simple human one-to-one -one contact is disappearing. And that's happened in diplomacy as well. You know, that, you actually sit down in a room with another person and directly talk to him or her. Instead, you know, you fax, you email, that's good. I mean, but but I, I would suggest that's one of the problems, that, um, you know, simple human contact is, 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 is disappearing. Um, and, 
you know, I've always, I always felt it was tremendously important in diplomatic work to, to actually go out and meet people, you know, not just answer emails from Washington. I, by people, I mean the people in the country where I was serving. So, you know, I think people are talking indeed. They, they, uh, even though they, quotes communicate more, they, they perhaps don't talk to one another. Uh, um, and what's the solution for that? Well, it's, it's, very, it's a difficult question. Um, it's a very difficult question. I mean, you know, people are, I mean, Harold Laswell was talking about that, you know, the great propaganda expert who wrote the first, well, he, Lippmann, of course, wrote about propaganda, but Laswell's book was, you know, about propaganda techniques in World War I, very detailed analysis and saying that people were atomized, you know, that, which that's what helped to make propaganda possible. Well, look at today, how much more atomized we are today than during the World War I period, you know, people become individual little islands, uh, despite these, this increase in mass communications. And, and you could put this on a higher, on a global, even national scale, that, you know, even though nations talk more and more, still, you know, there's not this one-to-one -one contact. So um, I think, though, what's very, very important is to maintain these educational exchanges, to expand, expand them, uh, you know, it's a wonderful investment in, in, in our country's future. It doesn't cost much money. Uh, you know, it, it invites people here where uh, up-and-coming people, people who will make a difference, uh, and, and shows them America as it is. And, uh, and it's amazing the impact that it has because, you know, if somebody comes to the United States on an exchange program for six months to a year, they go back to their country, they may disagree with American policy, you know, at certain policies. However, you know, they've seen America, they understand America more, uh, and they're willing to maintain a dialogue with America even if, if they disagree with its immediate policies. Now, people who have not been to the United States, who don't know this country, that's much less likely, I would argue. You know, it's, it would be seeing America just in terms of its immediate foreign policy. And, you know, dismissing the entire country because of that. And I don't think that's in our national interest. But do you think there's a, a legitimate uh, disconnect between our foreign policy, uh, our motives behind our foreign policy? And I, I do believe that a lot of Americans are sincerely, uh, you know, kind-hearted, generous, and everything that when they come here. But there is that disconnect in that, that they do see these, these policies. Can you speak towards, you know, our... Well, why do they hate our foreign policy? Well, I think this administration, that's why I consider this administration so disastrous, because it's, it's, it has, you know, caused this break between us and the rest of the world. Um, you know, it has characterized the world in black and white terms. You are with us or against us. Um, you know, it has created these, these categories uh, that exclude rather than include. And, you know, foreign policy should try as much as possible to be inclusive, not exclusive. Um, and, you know, Americans, I would say, are extremely, are an extremely welcoming people. Um, they open their doors. Uh, however, this administration has painted this picture of the outside world, and it's made up of terrorists, of, you know, America, and so on. And now, you know, there's this fear. It's the politics of fear. Well, I think what this administration has done is to internationalize Willie Horton. I mean, you'll recall in Bush one we had Willie Horton as you know the, the big enemy that we had to watch out for. Now the big enemy is, you know, the outside world. Um, I have great doubts about the use of the word war uh, expression, war on terror. It makes no sense to me. Uh, I mean, terror is a tool, you know, a despicable one. But how do you fight terror? I mean, it's like Brzezinski said, you know, speaking of Brzezinski, he said it would be like saying that in World War II we should have fought against the Blitzkrieg as opposed to the Nazis. <laughs> you know, and that's one. I mean, how do you fight a tool? And two, when does this end? I mean, how do you, when are we going to say the war on terror has ended? That's what frightens me, that we're, we're getting ourselves in this new century in a state of perpetual war. Now, you know, the Cold War was long enough, but still, it was a Cold War. With this, it's, a, you know, 
it's it's not a world, it's not World War Two or World War One, but still, I mean, your generation is facing the prospect of perpetual war, unless, you know, the definition has changed, unless this concept war on terror is is abandoned and. And we say, you know, yes, we are fighting certain terrorist groups. We are fighting the following terrorist groups. One, two, three, four. That I understand. You know, we are fighting Al-Qaeda. That's... And a third thing about, you know, creating this war on terror is that now any terroristic group feels that it belongs to this vast movement against the United States, that it's part of what the U.S. has characterized as this universal enemy. And I would suggest that gives them encouragement, and, you know, uh, because and that's not in our national interests. So, you know, I think that it was so flawed from the very beginning to use that term, war on terror. I mean, it, it, you know, it was from a PR point of view, it sounded, you know, but, you know, it, 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 it strengthened, if you will, it whipped up the national will. But look at the consequences. We're in... In two, war, in two countries, Afghanistan and Iraq, under the excuse or under the, under the reasoning that we're fighting the war on terror. Now, well, you know, it's, when does it end? I mean, I think it's a legitimate question to ask. I mean, wars, I mean, you fight wars to end wars. <laughs> and this one, I mean, you know, war on poverty, war on drugs, it's, it's, it's the same kind of thinking, you know, fighting... Um, concepts that, or states, if you will, states of being that you can't really end through war. Um. Well, I want to go back to, oh, yeah, just, yeah, when you're, I guess we're, we're picking up the, the tapping, so we can either put a rug there. Oh, just, okay. Sure. Just, uh, sure, let me get something. Whoops. Yeah, okay. back to um, you know some of the propaganda techniques and how do you counter these type of techniques is it the, the, the role of journalists to say well let's let's take a step back and see what kind of techniques they're using and can you speak well to absolutely them? I you know okay. I, and, and also I'm, gonna, I'm not going to be including my my uh, questions so. okay well you know it's naive to think that you can reduce propaganda to a set of techniques you know there was this Institute for Propaganda Analysis that was set up in the 1930s where they, you know, identified seven propaganda techniques, among them name-calling and so forth. I mean, it, it's not that simple. It, it's not a question of identifying certain little tricks. Um, rather, it's having a very critical state of mind about whatever is said and to try to understand why, what is the purpose behind the message. That's the most important. What is the purpose behind the message? Now, sometimes there is a link, and I hope there is a link behind, between the purpose and the message, you know, where they jive. Then I would say, that's okay. But when it's obvious that there's no connection between the purpose and the message, then you start, I think a journalist should start worrying. And I think in the case of the war in Iraq, uh, journalists were not making a distinction. I mean, what was the purpose of going into Iraq? And what was the message that was sent about our going there? What was the purpose? You know, we still don't quite know. Now, we had all kinds of messages, you know, we could get rid of weapons of mass destruction, you know, get rid of Saddam Hussein, get rid of, you know, start a democratic uh, revolution or a change in that part of the world. So there was this disconnect. Uh, and I don't think journalists w were looking at it that way. I mean, they, um, uh, they, they bought up the administration's line much too easily. I mean, I, I'll never forget watching the press conferences of the Pentagon during the war. I mean, you know, when the war was, was I mean, it was veneration of, of Mr. Rumsfeld. I mean, somebody should have said, you know, what's going on? And this whole embedded business is fraudulent. It's fraudulent. Because, you know, on a human level, I would say no journalist who is with you know 15, 15 Marines, you know, in battle situations, is going to be able to really 
take a, an objective uh, perspective on this. Humanly, I would find it impossible. Now, maybe some journalists can. Now, okay, maybe if you just want to, quote, report from the battlefield, on that level, it's okay. I mean, okay up to a point, because what are you really seeing? I mean, you know, how much do you see when you're embedded with a bunch of, of soldiers? I, I, you know, you, you can report certain things, but and that's important up to a point, but I think the embedded business was, was used as a way to muzzle the press, to prevent it from asking critical questions about why are we doing this, you know, uh, what is really going on. Uh, you know, if you're there with the, with, the, with, the, with the American troops, do you really see what's happened to the Iraqi civilians? Are you covering the Iraqi civilian deaths? Are you hearing what the Iraqis are saying about the American invasion? I mean, would, how come there were no American journalists doing that? Very few, where you had to go to Al Jazeera for that. Um, so, you know, I think that the press was conned into that embedded business. Um, and, you know, it's of course natural in times of war to turn to the commander in chief and to trust him, I mean, I, and, and to hope in him. But uh, I, I think the, the media today is, I mean, it's clear. New York Times uh, has, has realized that it made serious mistakes in the coverage of the war, serious oversights. Um, you know, just accepting sources without really critically uh, asking, you know, where they were from and so on. And again, not asking what's the purpose, you see, of all this. Because that, you know, um, uh, why is the message hiding another purpose? Um, so. You know, you can't reduce propaganda to, to a number of techniques, but um, it's important, I think, for journalists not to confuse propaganda with, I mean, truth. I mean, I, you know, I don't want truth. It's a difficult thing to get at, but at least at a certain level of truth that is higher than the uh, facts and images that are provided to you as a journalist to be, quotes, credible. Okay, and you know some of the things that I've kind of discovered in this this process of, of observing it is that whenever a journalist makes try to say, well, is it about oil? They would say, no, it's ridiculous to even think it's about the oil, you know. Or uh, you know, talk to some uh, journalists who uh, were going to go on to uh, either 60 Minutes or Nightline and say, well, look at the connections to Israel, but the producers are too worried to be calling anti-Semitic, you know. So there seemed to be this self censorship of, uh, in a way, they didn't want to be controversial, you know, and, and hurt their market. So, you know, do you have any, you know, what is the connection between, you know, our, the oil resources or, you know, was it to protect Israel or from your sense, do you have any additional insight on this? Well, again, I, I think, <clears throat> I don't. Um, you know, my initial uh, reading of, of this war was that it was a strictly political thing for domestic American politics, that, you know, it got the okay of the White House, that, yeah, we're going to do this because, you know, uh, George W. Bush will gain more votes in, in, in the congressional elections. Uh, we need that for the image of the president, um, you know, uh, and, you know, we haven't done enough to really, you know, get the American people behind us, and this is the way we'll do it. Um, See, I just don't think that this White House thinks, you see. And I don't think they're capable of, 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 of any kind of, of, quotes, policy with a capital P. I mean, a, a really, you know, a really thought out Middle East policy. I don't think they think that way. I mean, these are people who think in narrow political day-to-day -day terms, who are absolutely parochial in their thinking. What's important is winning the game. And the game is American politics. I often think George W. Bush looks at politics like a game of baseball, you know, where you play very hard to win the game. Um, but anything else doesn't matter. Ideas, don't, you don't care about ideas. You don't care about anything outside of the game, you know, be it France, <laughs> the Vatican, you know. And it's a certain mentality that I, uh, that I see there. Um, uh, you know, the joy of, of, of winning, which brings power, um, you know, kind of euphoric. But, but it, it's not 
they don't have, they, they don't think about concepts and um, so that's why I, I don't, I'm skeptical about a grand strategy <laughs> on the part of this administration. You know, I, I, and, and two, you know, the incredible confusion of the Washington bureaucracy. Please remember that, to get a, stra a grand strategy through, I mean, be it for oil, you name it. I, I just don't see them, you know, I just don't see it. Um, <laughs> You know, I mean, just these hearings on 9-11, you know, Clark, for example, I mean, you know, uh, you know, people fighting one another the most, you don't develop a grand strategy with that kind of a situation. You know, an uh, anti-intellectual White House, a completely confused bureaucracy. What, what, you, what you develop are, is a major screw-up, which unfortunately, Iraq, which unfortunately has, is, take, is becoming a tragedy because Nearly a thousand Americans are, going to, are dead there. You know, God knows how many Iraqis have been killed. And we, you know, as you know, the Pentagon doesn't keep track of, of, of civilians killed. And I think that's, you know, here we are, we're going to you know, win hearts and minds in Iraq. And we don't even know how many people have been killed there by our, you know, by our troops. I mean, so, you know, it's a screw up. And you know, I've worked. I work in government long enough to know that major screw-ups occur in government. In fact, I would suggest, perhaps facetiously, that major screw-ups occur more frequently than uh, grand strategies. In the sense, grand strategies being implemented, especially you know, in our government, which I mean, the plus side of all this, of course, is you know, it's totalitarian countries that develop you know a grand. I mean, because it's a small group of people who actually make all the decisions, you see. But do you think that it may have been started with a grand strategy and then just got out of control? And then the no, I, as I say, I, my, my reading of it, and, you know, I don't have access to all the sources of information, uh, but, you know, what I have is my experience in government, what I have is my close reading of the press uh, during this period, and what I see is, you know, narrow political considerations in this war. They thought it would be neat and easy that, you know, a W would land on the aircraft carrier. I mean, even I don't think they thought that far, but, you know, it would be mission accomplished, a perfect visual, you know, the president in his, you know, uh, air, you know, pilot suit. And then all of a sudden they realize, wait a minute, you know, now they're starting to realize, wait a minute, but hey, it's a country out there, you know, and <laughs> it's not that... It's a parochialism. Now, you know, they're awfully clever people. I mean, and within their own categories, they play the game very well. You know, Karl Rove plays the political game, you know, professionally, uh, but there are no wider considerations. They're not interested in that. They don't want to think about the wider, consider about the wider considerations, you see, uh, because that gets in the way of the narrow political considerations. You know, and, and I can just see the staff meetings. You know, we don't want to hear that. You know, stop the, you know, let, let's get to the matter at hand, which is, you know, what's on the agenda. And what happened, you see, with this misadventure in Iraq, as I see it, is nobody from either the State Department or the Pentagon would most unlikely at one point saying, wait a minute, why are we doing this? What are the long-term consequences? I don't think that question was asked. Or if it was asked, it was ignored? Or, it, you know, I, I, I don't think it was asked at the highest levels. I think at lower levels in the State Department, and we've seen this in the press, you know, there, there was some effort at post-war planning. You know, they, there was post-war planning, but was, as far as I know, it's what I've read, it was ignored. You know. Uh, okay. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, back to uh, international law uh, for a second. Um, can you give me a sense of when the U.S. signed on to the uh, U.N. Charter, how does the hierarchy work that do we have to follow the, the U.N. Charter or does the War Power Act uh, supersede that or is international law then become a part of domestic law that we have to follow? Or can you give me a sense of... No, I wouldn't be good at that. I, I, I'm, that's not a question I can answer well. I, okay. I, I, you know, I don't want to <laughs> be honest with you. Okay. Um, let's see. 
Oh, yeah. The, going for where we're at right now, uh, do you have a vision for, you know, where we could be with, with world peace? Like, how could we go from where we're at right now and really have um, everyone working together? And, and what's not happening to get to that point? Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's awfully hard to, to talk about global solutions. Um, but in our case, there really has to uh, very important, there has to be a change of attitude on the part of the U.S. government in its relationship with the outside world. Um, you know, I don't like the word humility, uh, which apparently was used by Mr. Bush as he was, well, we all know that it was going to be the new humility in foreign policy it never happened. Um, which again, for me, you know, offsets these, this idea that it was a grand strategy. I mean, yeah. uh, you know, this was an administration that was against nation building. You know. <laughs> uh, but uh, what we have to be, we have to, to listen more. I mean, we simp to, to what the outside world says. Um, we have to show up more, just be there, just show our interest in, in, in uh, in international organizations, I mean, you know, not dismiss them out of hand, but be interested in them, be critical of them. Of course, I mean, the United Nations has become, is a bureaucracy, I mean, but, you know, consider the alternatives to the United Nations. So, you know, we should at least show an interest in these organizations. I mean, and we've got UNESCO, we've joined UNESCO, I think that was a good step. Um, um, so I would say, you know, we have to listen more. We have to show uh, an eagerness to be present at international conferences, at interna in international organizations. And then uh, third, we have to make a commitment uh, to long-term international exchanges, especially in the field of education uh, and culture. I think that's very important because, you know, the world is becoming globalized, but there are reactions to globalization. Uh, and you could say, you know, the whole uh, upheaval in the Muslim world today is linked to that, the kind of cultural reaction to globalization. And, and I think one of the ways to deal with the effects of globalization, some of which are negative, is through international, um, you know, arrangements, programs, uh, multilateral uh, programs. And then finally, you know, there's this enormous gap between wealthy countries such as ours and the rest of the world. And, you know, we're not asking that question in the United States enough because we're living, uh, as Nicholas von Hoffman, I haven't read the book, but I saw the review, he calls it the American biosphere. Where, and, you know, you, you realize this biosphere, I, would, I think it's a good word, in a way exists when you go back to America after having been abroad for many years, as I've been, you know, in the foreign service, I was, you know, I'd be in a foreign country, I'd come back here. And you realize how completely America is immersed in itself, despite the fact that, you know, it, it's, it, it expands internationally in all kinds of directions, but this is kind of American reality, <laughs> uh, you know, that is so totally American and totally unconcerned with the rest of the world, that you don't find out many other countries. That because of where they are, because of both geographically and historically, have to take into consideration uh, the outside. And it's an ironic situation because we're a nation of immigrants. We get all kinds of people coming in all the time. And yet we're an insular nation in many ways. Um, in part due to our media, I mean, which is, you know, it's an amazing thing when you get back to the States and you look at the front page and, you know, you know world news is below the sport news, <laughs> you know, I, uh, and, and, you know, you could say the good thing about that is that it makes American focus on their own country, you know, they're, uh, but still, I mean, my main point is that we simply can't afford to just live in this American biosphere for, for demographic reasons. Uh, that, you know, uh, I think there should be policies that make it, and I'm not an expert in all this, um, make it possible for third world countries to, to uh, you know, be able to enter the American market. I mean, it's very important. You know, you, and from my, my reading of things, it's not easy. Um, 
I think that's the big challenge for this next for this century is this enormous gap between the wealthy and, and, and the poor and I, you know I, I, I think in terms of our national interests I mean I'm not talking about you know just being nice to other people I'm talking about this country and what's going to happen to it if we if we if we get lost immersed totally immersed in our American biosphere I mean we're, we're going to suffer the consequences it's it's almost you know, sometimes I see, I'm a student of Russian history, and I see analogies between late imperial Russia and, and well, the U.S., where, you know, you had this elite in, in, the, in Russia, the nobility, the autocracy, living in, you know, the capital, St. Petersburg and Moscow, and around them was this mass of peasants, you know, and they essentially ignored them. Uh, and the result, we all know what the disastrous result of that was. I mean, you know, it, it, it's, it, it's a far-fetched analogy. But, but what, I, what I'm trying to say is that you can't, you can't have this kind of a gap and expect in the long term to, to survive. I mean, the wealthy. <laughs> and uh, when you look at the... Did you watch any uh, television news media leading up to the war in Iraq? And was oh, yeah. Well, somebody... I, I looked at... Fox and some in the morning, I th um, and somebody told me, "Listen, John, looking at Fox in the morning is like drinking in the morning. It's not something you should do. <laughs> it, it has the same—I mean, it has the same kind of effect on your mind as alcohol has on your stomach early in the morning. I mean, you simply shouldn't do it." Uh, I was appalled. I, I've used that word too often, appalled. But I—I I, I, I just again, it was a shock to me coming back to the states. I left before Fox and uh, O'Reilly had been part of our uh, media uh, sphere. When I came back, I just couldn't get over it. I mean, the strident tone, America first, you know, and dismissal, dismissive of other opinions, and, and a sense gung-ho, you know, uh, nationalism, and frankly, you know, war, I mean, leading us to war. Uh, and, you know, the coverage of the war, I mean, it's a spectator sport, you know, go team, go, and look at our, look at the way we're, you know, I mean, just horrible, this is war. And it goes back to what, you know, Mr. Card was saying, a product, you know, and, and the media assisted in selling this product to the American people, you know, and, you know, buy it, it's, it's good. But in fact, it, first of all, it's not a product, and even if it were a product, it's allowed, you know, it, so, no, I, I just found it, there was no, no alternative point of view in the major U.S. media, as far as I could tell. And even the traditional liberal voices, you know, the Post, the Times, they all went on board, you know. Um, and, you know, somebody should have been asking, you know, what is, what are we, what are we doing here? And I, I didn't see it anywhere. No, I, I mean, I saw it, you know, in the Internet, uh, I saw it abroad. Um, I heard it from colleagues at the State Department, but major media, very little. It was, you know, we got we to gotta wipe him out, you know, regime change. And I think one thing that Saddam played into in a way is that he, he was a human rights violator, and so yeah. he was susceptible to this good versus evil. And, and I think, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the writings of Nancy Snow. Of, no, uh, sure, I know Nancy sure, yeah. And, you know, she writes about, yeah. you know, this black-white nature. Yeah. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, you know, by the, log the logic of, of, of getting rid of Mr. La uh, Saddam Hussein, by that kind of logic, we should be invading Cuba right now. You know, I mean... It, you know, the world is imperfect. Uh, I mean, there are all kinds of, of third-rate dictators running around. I, nobody would justify Saddam Hussein's crimes, but the point is, is you know, our 1, 000, nearly 1,000 Americans have died for this. And now, you know, if you weigh the moral consequences, I, I just, um, you know, it just wasn't worth the cost, and that's what I felt all along. I mean, I'm not, I, I don't pretend, I, I predict the future, but, you know, I just don't, you know, I just don't think that, uh, it was worth the cost uh, to to us to to get rid of Mr. Saddam Hussein, and, and you know even in the long term, it would have been so much more in our national interest if, if the Iraqis themselves had gotten rid of him. You know, then we would have, 
you know, we, if we had waited, eventually this regime was going to end. I mean, just as it, in Eastern Europe, these, you know, t semi-totalitarian, idiotic regimes ended, and they ended by themselves. Now, we, we contributed to that, but we didn't. Can you imagine sending American troops to, to you know, take down Lenin statues? We didn't. And that's one of the reasons we're so popular, or were so popular in Eastern Europe, is that, you know, we never became occupiers. And because of my experience in Eastern Europe, I know how, how dangerous it is to become an occupier. I mean, the Soviets, you know, they were finished because they were occupiers. And we, 